Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, bookmark that, and then uh, go to Romans chapter 4. It's going to come up on my screen if you don't have uh, your Bibles with you, and I'm going to begin with that proverb right there. But let's pray. Father, your name is truly glorious. It is this name that brings salvation. It is this name that brings liberation and restoration to the individual. In whatever capacity we find ourselves or scenario, your good work and your good will can be done to those who live according to your purpose. So, Father, I pray that you give us sight, that you give us the ability to envision things and, and declare things that are not of the natural realm, but of the supernatural realm because they're birthed of the spirit of the living God. And you have anointed your people with a word and you've commissioned us with a mission to go into all the world and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and to baptize and to do your work. So Father, I pray that if we have found ourselves exhausted these past couple months, that we would allow you to search us out in Jesus' name, amen. Just as if I believe if I had a headache that was persistent or an arm ache or something, that naturally I would go to a doctor. There are spiritual things in our lives that can give us some form of indicator that we have found ourselves misaligned. And I'm not saying walking out of his will, but maybe we found ourselves inundated with the things of the world more than we have been concerned with the things of God. This message has been burning in my heart for months. I couldn't tell you how long exactly. I can actually go back probably about a year or so when I started writing uh, in Ezekiel about dry bones. You guys are all familiar with that story. But that kind of started to snowball in my, in my personal studies in, in this past week. I found out I was preaching today. And two weeks ago, pastor preached on the words that we speak. Last week, he preached on blurred vision. And the Lord has spoke to my heart about Proverbs 20, chapter 12. It says this, the hearing eye, the hearing eye, that is not what the word of God says, because I've been practicing that all week and I kept saying it. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Think about these two inlets into your mind and into the way that you perceive the world. Think about how these two inlets affect your mental health and the, your motivation and your ambition. Those are two words that the Lord spoke to me that are going to be kind of brought up as I go through the sermon today. But if you protect your inlets, then you protect your outlets. If you protect the things that come into your spiritual system, you protect the words that you speak. The three word title that I have today is Speak the Word. And I wanted it in all caps. I forgot to tell you. But because I wanted it to be an emphasis that we are supposed to speak the word between identity politics, sexual identity, individualism, there is a plethora. Everybody say plethora. You know what that word means because of the three amigos, and you know it. <laughs> Remember that handshake? I'm not going to do it because if you know, you know. That's as far as we're going with that. But there's an abundance of avenues that we have trusted. Pastors and mainstream, uh, in, in the mainstream uh, scene prophesying things and declaring things that we have believed news sources that we would identify as being trustworthy saying things and we've invested and we've we've put these voices in our minds and so the hearing ear suddenly is causing confusion because it's not what the seeing eye is perceiving i used to play basketball for six hours back in the day i used to be able to play basketball for six hours now <laughs> not even close. But I want, I want you to think about something. If we have exhausted our efforts, then is it because, and we feel exhausted today, if we feel drained, is it because we just simply have not reconnected to the source? Back in the day when I would play basketball for about six hours, I would thirst for one of two things. It was typically water, or for some weird reason, my body really wanted apple juice. So I would go to the gas station and spend two eighty nine dollars or whatever on like a 12-ounce bottle of Ocean Spray apple juice. Same price for a gallon of gas today. We know where this is going. But I'm going to tell you, if you find yourself exhausted, you thirst for his righteousness. John chapter 7, verse 37. Jesus says, whoever puts their trust in me, in other words, hears the words of the Lord and puts their trust in him, Whoever puts their trust in me, as the scripture says, living water will flow from your inmost being. You will be alive. God has called his people to be alive. God has called his church to be vibrant. 
He has called our spirits to be reactive and responsive when the word is preached. Did you hear me, church? When the word of God is preached, we are supposed to come alive. I got some news that might surprise one of, some of you. If you're a miserable person, I'm going to drive you nuts because my joy gauge in the Lord is off the charts. And if I find out you don't like me, I will make sure that you know I'm there. <laughs> it's who I am. I'll say hello from across the room, and I'll even do a dance while doing it because, man, God is good. He's called us to be alive, but I'm consistent. I shared this story with the early service. I'm consistent. When I was 19, I had a girl break up with me because I was too happy. And while I was sitting in the bed of her truck, she was breaking up with me, getting mad that I was laughing that she was breaking up with me. So I'm consistent. But if the Lord wants to supply your joy, then rejoice. That's joy on the repeat button. That is having that joy constantly. If the Lord wants to supply your joy, then enjoy. That's finding joy in the season. It's finding joy in what the things that God is doing, not necessarily the things that the eyes are seeing. Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 16, says, Therefore, the promise, everyone say the promise. In other words, you're hearing the promise. The promise comes by faith. Your hearing ear affects how you view the world. Your hearing ear affects if you view the world as redeemable. If you view people as redeemable. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Because we mess it up, right? Some of the people that I have thought had it all together... We're off the rocker. Some of the people I thought that were off the rocker had the most sanity of all of us. So therefore, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. The, listen to what the rest of the scripture says. Though we regarded Christ in this way, what was the end result of that? Your hearing ear, maybe these past couple of months, has given you a narrative that it is an aligning with what your seeing eye is perceiving. And I honestly feel like I honestly feel like the church is resisting a season of discouragement because of this stuff. And I'm not saying you're in a season of discouragement or depression. I'm saying that we're resisting this thing. And then it's just kind of hanging over us. We have allowed these talking heads in the culture to speak into our minds that we have thought was absolute truth. And the reality of it is I don't think anybody was trying. I don't know people's motives, so I can't say this, but if I were just to assess from my angle, I don't think people were trying to deceive anyone. I don't think that was the intent. But the reality is we are in the wake of a lot of false prophecies and a lot of false narratives that we believe to be true. And when Revelation chapter 3, verse 22 says, let he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now what we're seeing is that the church has given us a complete narrative that, that isn't what we're seeing. So we have to believe in the things that the church is saying to us, not what these talking heads are. This should be a great indicator of us to say, the word of man is fallible. Shut it off for a little bit. Let's get to the infallible promises of God because they come by faith. The promises by faith so that, oh, you know, let me give you this, let me give you this just directive that the Lord spoke to my heart. I'm sorry if I get worked up. God is good. <laughs> Don't be discouraged. Don't find yourself in a season of discouragement. Just reconnect to the source. Get that apple juice in you. It's what your spirit is thirsty for. It's, he's, you're thirsty for his righteousness. Reconnect to that source. Because the promise comes by faith, so it may be by grace. It may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. It's pretty spectacular when you, do, when you get into that and study what the father of many nations means. He is the father in the sight of God in whom he believed. And then listen to this last portion. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that are not. To declare the things of God means we have to believe the promises of God because it is by faith that these things come into being. The word says, I have, I have believed, therefore I have spoken. What have you believed? Well, what are you speaking? What is, what is coming out of you? Are living waters flowing from your being? Are living waters the, of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ flowing out of you? 
The promise comes by faith. This should give us motivation. And when we get motivation, our momentum should follow us because God has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light to declare what? Regurgitated false information that we've heard from the news? Let's put a stop to that today. God has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light to declare his praises. Amen. He is worthy, amen? Is he deserving, church? He is are you radical for the holiness of God? Are you hungry for the teaching of the word? And are you hungry for the fellowship of the church? These are the things of God. Proper worldview comes from a proper biblical view. What I mean by that is, is if, if I need to view the world the way that it is, I have to accept the reality that's in front of me in order for me to properly minister this word. I can't think of something else that's not there. I can't take my situation and wish that uh, a relationship was better than what it was. If I'm going to properly minister this word, a proper worldview comes from a proper biblical view. So what is the word directing me and correcting me to do in my situation? June 3rd, 2020, the Lord spoke this to my heart. Roger actually just said it to me the other day, but it was in, it was in quarantine when we got this when I got this word from the Lord. It was the believers trying to exist in the world without the world existing in the believer. And I don't remember the context when I brought it to the youth, but in this instance, what I'm saying is that we are trying to exist in this culture without being swayed by every wind of doctrine that comes our way. Read about it in Ephesians. It talks about how when we grow up together as the body of believers, then we're not swayed by every wind of doctrine. There's a power that exists in the fellowship of God. His spirit is here, and you are an asset to that. Don't forget that. So proper engagement for us in the world begins with the proper gauge. If I'm going to engage the culture, my gauge has to be through this word first. Every one of us in here that has a vehicle has a gas gauge. I can't make up the amount of gas that's in my car, right? It's a reality. For me to properly gauge the length that I have or the, how far I can go, I've got to go off my gas gauge. I love my wife, but it was a little too close for me yesterday when we got in the car and we're driving to Hall Road, and I'm like, it's near the red. No, oh, <laughs> it's not good. So the proper, why is it important to not have a broken gauge, a gas gauge? Because long term, you can cause damage to the fuel pump, and in the winter, it can cause damage to the fuel line if you let your gas run late. Husbands, go ahead and say it. Say, amen. <laughs> Come on, redlining too much during the winter. So we have to have a proper gauge in order for us to properly engage. I can feel right now in my spirit that the Lord is calling me away from a lot of the information that I'm receiving in the culture because proper biblical engagement comes from a proper world gauge. Didn't I just say the opposite? Yeah, it works both ways. I said that. What I mean by that is we can't create scenarios that aren't existing. In the book, when Paul was writing Romans, for example, he wasn't in his, or when he was in the Roman cell and he was writing the prison uh, epistles, he wasn't just making up situations. He wasn't in a prison chiseling on the wall, hashtag not my Roman emperor, and hashtag Yobo, you're only beheaded once, you know, all these cultural things that we're seeing. His reality of a situation, the Holy Spirit used him to write three quarters of the New Testament because it's what his situation was. So proper engagement comes from a proper world gauge. In order for us to properly engage, we have to make sure that we have our proper gauge. One is going to shape the other. We can have our view of the world shape how we view the word, or we can have our view of the word shape how we view the world in our situation. We engage differently if we have a perspective that is gauged by truth. You guys are in Ezekiel 36. Let me get there in just a moment. So I have, I have terrible vision, legally blind. And two years ago, I posted this. Some of you may have read this, but I took my contacts out when I got home from a youth event. And it was late. Becky was sleeping, so I'm trying to be quiet. So after I take my contacts out and I put them in my contact case and wash in my hands, this spider darts by my foot. It looked like a wolf spider. It was huge. And so I'm staring at this thing, and, and I'm thinking, I want to kill this. I want to execute this thing. So how do I go about this? I need to Bruce Lee this thing through the floor. So I grabbed a towel, wrapped it around my hand, because if you've ever seen any ninja movies, that's what they do. So I'm thinking, I don't want this thing to live. So I go down very slowly, and I remember my heartbeat racing and my breathing increasing as I'm d making the descent to kill this thing. And I, and I, yeah, you know, try to kill this thing. And, and as I'm swinging down, it darts over by the toilet. So not only am I legally blind, there's a rogue spider that knows I want it dead. And I'm looking at this thing 
and it's looking at me, and I can feel the tension. And as I'm staring at this thing, I'm like, I, I do this move, you know, you squint, because if you don't have your glasses on, you squint, you can see better. I'm thinking, that looks like a ball of string. So as I get closer, it was a ball of string the whole time. <laughs> ah, lovely day. <laughs> See, when we lose our spiritual sight, we can be chasing imaginary spiders in the culture, smash someone's opinion, smash someone's motivation, inadvertently say things that cause more confusion than it does healing. Ezekiel 36, I said all that to build up to this right here. Ezekiel prophesied at a time when Israel is in captivity to the Babylonians. He's actually speaking at a time when Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. You guys know those stories. So what I'm telling you, said all this to say this, Ezekiel cannot make up Israel's condition in order to minister the word to them. He can't just think that things are going to happen without the activity of God. That's important that we get that. He's not just thinking that things are going to happen without the word being spoken. Israel being in captivity is the reality of the situation and the messenger gets affected by the message and now he's going to go and he's going to declare this. Verse 1 in Ezekiel 36 says, Son of man, prophesy to the mountain of Israel and say, Mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Say, hear the word of the Lord. Who's he talking to? He's talking to mountains, right? It's crazy. Ezekiel looks nuts. He's talking to inanimate objects. You ever think you look crazy when you're talking to people about Jesus? I used to talk to inanimate objects. That was before I knew the Lord. That's another testimony for another day. But have you ever felt like people look at you like you're nuts as you're sharing the word of the Lord? He's talking to the mountains, and he's saying, mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. What is the truth speaking about your situation? What is the word of God now? I said all that to say, knock those voices out of your head. We have a president, whether we accept him or not, he's there. We have a political culture. We have a culture that's trying to treat transgenderism to our children. That, to me, is not an issue of politics. Because my daughter doesn't belong in a room with someone of the opposite sex in a bathroom. God has made, hear me, if this is something that you, that you struggle with, that God's grace is there for you. He designed you with intent and specificity in your mother's womb years ago. He, he formed you. Men and women, you read about it in Genesis, were created in an honorable image. One being man, one being woman, in the image of God. And that is honorable. But for some reason, we don't think that it's enough. For some reason, our culture is trying to teach our kids, you're not enough. We're causing more confusion to those that are already confused. Remember how I said your hearing ear and your seeing eyes affect your mental health? What are you absorbing as truth? What is it that you're absorbing of truth, as truth? The word is correctional and directional. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be fully equipped. Refocus your energy. Refocus your outlets by reconnecting your inlets. What I love about sitting under Pastor Jim's uh, ministry is that we know that the truth is spoken. There's sometimes where, where somebody might say, oh, he's just old-fashioned. No, he's biblical, man. There's a difference. I don't believe in marriage the way that it is because I'm old-fashioned. I believe it's the way that God has ordained it through the word. It's blessed. It's biblical. That's the way that you receive the blessing. I was out of line at some point in my life, but God has realigned my vision towards him. But the same truth that transformed Pastor Jim however many years ago, I'm not going to guess because I want to keep my job and I want to be safe. <laughs> it's the same truth that transformed me in 2002. It's the same truth that's preached today. It's the same truth that was preached 2,000 years ago. From the very beginning, this truth has been preached. Why? Because truth is not generational. It is transformational. It is applicable to every generation. It doesn't matter the chaos that we're seeing. It doesn't matter if we're seeing that there is, is no land. Did we just sing a song that the harvest is ready? Didn't Jesus say the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few? Truth isn't generational. It's transformational. If I had kept my contacts in, I would have been able to see the reality of what was by my foot was a string. But because I lost my focus, because I lost my vision, you couldn't convince me that it wasn't a spider. 
I was so convinced and deceived that what I saw was going to eat my foot. It sent me into a frenzy and a panic. I, I, have, to, I have to share this with you guys, you know, and I know I'm running out of time. Worship was awesome today, but I have to share this with you. This has to do with hear the word of the Lord. I may be speaking to an individual right now. I shared this in the early service. About 10 years ago, I received about 31 text messages in one setting from someone who I love. And in these text messages was a lot of, it was just nothing but bashing my character, saying one thing after another about me negatively. Not once did they say what I did to them. So I asked back, my simple response is, what did I do to warrant these, these uh, accusations? And, and they said, you know, I just told you. And I said, go back and reread, because I did a couple times. <laughs> you didn't tell me one thing I did to you. All you did was bash my character. And they said, their two-word response to me was, never mind. After 31 messages, you do not have to absorb the accusations that are made against you. You hear what I'm saying? There's an accuser of the brethren. There's an accuser of the brethren, and he's trying to look for a reason to accuse you. He wants to discredit you. He wants to discredit your testimony. He wants to discourage you. If we keep going in the scripture, look what verse, look what verse 2 says. After hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. The enemy said of you, why should we be concerned about what the enemy is trying to accuse, of, accuse us of? He's going to tell you white lies. He's going to tell you half-truths. White lies are not covered in the blood and half-truths intend to deceive. He's going to try to maybe tell you a half-truth about who you were or a mess-up that you had. But the full truth I'm going to tell you is you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do not accept those accusations. Don't believe them. Are you hearing the voices? And and now you see yourself, the seeing eye views yourself off of the accusations that have been made against you. Don't absorb that garbage as being truth because it's not absolute. If it's not sanctified in the blood, then get it out of there. Refuse it. You do not have to accept an accusation as being half-truths. It's what he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you white lies and half-truths. There are many outlets speaking their truth, which is no truth at all. This generation is inundated inundated with half-truths. Think about some of the stuff that we have seen in the media lately. Aren't they showing partial pictures? Why is this? Because they're trying to get the innocent to be accused and convicted before the full truth is known. That's what the accuser of the brethren is trying to do. He's trying to get inside your head to make you think that you're accused. But guess what? The blood of Jesus has set you free. Get the full picture. The enemy said of you. Who cares what the enemy said of me? I know God's declaring what the enemy said because he's about to declare a good thing, which is what I'm going to close with. The enemy does not have in mind the things of God. Get thee behind me, Satan. So I want, before I get into this next part, I want you to just ask you this question. And you know the answer. I know the answer from my life these past couple months. Have you been more, have you been more concerned with the outcome of November's election than you are consumed with the outcome of Calvary? What do you believe? What have you been speaking? What have you been sharing? If I were to look back a few weeks ago, I, could say, I would say, wow. That's why I asked this question, because essentially I feel like the Holy Spirit was saying, stop believing everything you hear is being true. Even if it seems good, it can be misleading. The enemy said to you, aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. Verse 3, therefore prophesy and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, because they ravaged and crushed you from every side. Once again, the enemy does not have in the mind the things of God, so that you become the possession of the rest of the nations and the object of people's malicious talk and slander. Therefore, mountains of Israel, he's talking to mountains, he's talking about you setting up and, and claiming things and proclaiming things for those that are far off. Hear the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the mountains and hills, the ravines and valleys, to the desolate ruins and the deserted towns that have been plundered and ridiculed by the rest of the nations around you. This is what the sovereign Lord says. In my burning zeal, I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against Edom, for with glee and with malice in their hearts, they made my land their own possession so they might plunder its pasture land. 
Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I speak my jealous wrath because you have suffered the scorn of the nations. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I swear with uplifted hands that the nations around you will also suffer scorn. Brian, will you come up and start playing as I wind down? I'm going to read a little bit more, but I'm going to end with a call. We can't have an altar call. But Israel is at a complete place of desolation. I want you to think about your situation and your condition. Situation of life and condition. If you have hope, then you're right where you need to be. If you have that hope in the Lord that he is doing a good work, then you're right where you need to be. But if you lost sight of hope, and the way that you can tell if you lost sight of hope is if you feel helpless. If you feel helpless, it's because you have no hope. It's because you're hopeless. The Lord just talked about what the enemy was declaring to Israel. And Israel's situation was real, right? It wasn't like Ezekiel made it up. He just didn't fabricate the situation. It's what it was. But here's the thing. You are God's chosen people. We can see what sin does to our land, so to speak, our families, our children, grandchildren. We can see what happens in marriages. But we see Ezekiel is giving hope And that new hope creates a new focus. This is what I'm closing with in verse 8. It says, But you, mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit for my people, Israel, for they will soon come home. I am concerned for you and will look on you with favor. You will be plowed and sown, and I will cause many people to live on you. Yes, all of Israel. The towns will be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will increase the number of people and animals living on you and they will be fruitful and become numerous. I will settle people on you as in the past and will make you prosper. Everyone say prosper. Prosper. You're going to prosper more than before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will cause people, my people, Israel, to live on you. They will possess you, and you will be their inheritance. You will never again deprive them of their children. So the Lord is doing something within the church. He's saying, you look at this past season. You may have heard some things that affect the way that you see today. But in this moment, God is restoring the vision of the church to give us that blessed hope that we have in Jesus. It's not found in a political culture. It's not found in a school system. You can read about it in the word of God, but that kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven is a prayer for the individual man and woman that hears the promises. And now remember that these promises that we're hearing come by faith. So we have to believe it. Will you stand? If you find yourself in a situation right now and you have the faith that we preached about this morning in your heart and you want to declare to relationships, to friendships, to generations in your family, or you want to declare restoration, liberation, salvation over someone or in a relationship, you want to pray for healing right now.